Good day to everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where everyone is. This is Joseph Kavasani from Worldwide Markets, and we have an interesting topic here today on which there is very little agreement across a whole variety of commentators. Of course, some of the commentators will talk from where they sit, as the old phrase goes, but most of them um, are talking from some sort of informed analysis. So let us get started. It's I'm going to do um, something that I haven't done in a while. Uh, let's just take a look. Let's put up one of these charts here. Okay. Now, as everyone knows, one of my webinars, the topic today is high frequency trading in the currency markets. But in order to deal with that, we have to do two background items. One is the development of the currency trading markets in particular. Um, they're actually led the way to electronic trading. The second is how electronic trading and high frequency trading is used in the equity markets. There is a great variety of opinion on that, and I will try and cover it. Now, my background, as you know, is in currency trading. Um, I have pretty much hesitate to say it, but it's true, spanned the development of the electronic markets. I started in trading in 1988 when the markets were entirely voice broker markets, and I'm still in the markets a good 26 years later where the markets are now entirely electronic. During that development, it was the foreign exchange markets the currency markets, the private and essentially unregulated markets that led the way in the development of electronic trading. Um, long before the stock markets went electronic, the currency markets were already there. Now, as everyone knows from my webinars, um, if you have any questions or comments on any topic of this, any part of this, please type them in. I will certainly stop and answer, answer the questions to the best of my abilities, and at least expound upon them to the best of my abilities. Because a good deal of today's um, discussion will necessarily be on equities, with which I am familiar, but not an expert, certainly in the electronic parts of equity trading and how that has developed. Um, if anyone has, if I find there are a lot of questions on equity trading and how it relates to high frequency trading, um, we can stop and I will for a moment and I will get one of my colleagues here from our equity side. We've actually just at Worldwide Markets, we've actually just launched an equity product um, for non-U.S. citizens worldwide where you can actually trade U.S. stock equities. Anyway, Barry Bernstein, if I have a lot of questions. I may ask Barry to come in and answer them um, as they're typed in. I can probably answer them, but if there's anything that's specific, Barry may actually be the better person. Um, we've had a fascinating time with equities here. Um, just as an aside, I went to a, a B2B Bitcoin show yes, uh, two days ago in um, the Javits Center here in New York, and it was fascinating because so many of the participants, the young businessmen, um, the young part traders, uh, not so much traders, but programmers, reminded me of where we were in foreign exchange about 12 years ago, 13 years ago, around 2000, 2001, when we were just getting started. Um, nobody knew the direction the market would take. Nobody was really sure how the development would be, what was important, what wasn't, who would survive. It's fascinating to actually see that in a new market. Okay, so high frequency trading. I think we're going to deal with the high frequency trading aspect of it first from the equity side. Now, the entire focus of this discussion has been now, high frequency trading has been around for 15 years more um, with varying degrees of success to the people who are involved. Um, it has become pretty much a technology arms race um, in the firms that do it. The time that is necessary to get in front of something has shrunk so much that physical proximity is important. Now, as we all know, 
uh, electronic signals travel at the speed of light or close to it, I believe. Um, that's why computers work. Imagine if we had to wait for mechanical calculations to put up our charts. So it is important now for the high frequency traders that they get close to the exchanges where the information comes from because the distance actually of the cables makes a difference. Um, there are exchange practices that all firms have to have the same amount of cable length with the connection so that if one firm is located farther away and one firm closer, they will not have any undue advantage on that. But let's start in the beginning with high frequency trading. Then I'll move a little bit to the development of foreign exchange, which honestly is a much simpler topic because it's a much simpler market um, and it's a much less regulated market, which is part of it, of course. And then how the two coincide and see if there really is any high frequency trading advantage, disadvantage, or anything else going on in the currency markets. Equities originally had discrete exchanges where people put in their trades. Originally was open outcry. I mean, if you see those pictures on CNBC or any of the other business stations uh, that take uh, where they do the shot from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, I have been there for those shots many times, and I will tell you that the floor is largely empty. There's nobody standing. There are a few people standing around at the various special um, positions, but by and large, I don't know, 95% of the trading is electronic. There's almost nothing taking place on the floor. It's essentially a stage set. I used to go down there for CNBC and I'd stand in front of me and try to look around to see where there were some people. So when the shot came up, on the television, it actually looked like there was some activity on the floor. And in essence, there's very little activity on the floor. Everything's electronic. They have a couple of people there, I'm sure, just to act basically as extras on the floor. But there are no longer two or three big exchanges. There are upwards of 40 exchanges, various licensed dark pools, which are essentially unlicensed exchanges. Um, with private inputs, the regulation demands best, best price execution when an order comes in. So all of the exchanges are linked. So if you send an order to, say, the New York Stock Exchange or your broker sends it to the exchange, but the, and this is all computer done, that, so the next, the best price for that particular order is on some other exchange then the computers are supposed to route your information to that exchange for execution. This all takes place in milliseconds, or maybe we're dealing with nanoseconds at this point. I'm not exactly sure. It's not the retail traders whose orders get, uh, get the high-frequency traders running. But the high, the retail traders and the public perception of the exchanges is extremely important. So you are dealing with people who are on the exchanges and who have access to the information and pay huge fees to the exchanges for the execution of the trades. And the public perception that as the man who started all of this current discussion Michael Lewis has charged in his book using deliberately provocative language, which is actually not in the book. It's in the press release. Mr. Lewis is a very, very savvy fellow. He is an excellent writer. If anyone has read any of his books, they are they're brilliant. He is probably the best financial journalist out there and certainly the best writer. The most entertaining. Um, if you have never read any of his books. I, I do not know the man. I've never met him. I know he's from New Orleans. Other than that, I don't know too much about him. Um, what's the name of his first book? Uh, it's not the big short. Anyway, the first book, if you read that one, Liar's Poker. It's hysterically funny. And having worked on Wall Street in those years, I can tell you that a lot of the characterizations of people and attitudes is very, very true. And it's very funny. Anyway, um, the term rigged stock market is in his press release, it's not in the book. I will say one thing for Mr. Lewis, he is a master 
of public relations. I must have read through 20 or 30 articles um, about high frequency trading preparation for this webinar because I'm not originally a stock guy. And almost every single one in the first paragraph or two mentions Michael Lewis and his book. Could you get any better publicity, public relations for your book release, which was only released 10 days ago? The way he characterizes it, or the way I understand, and again, I'm saying I understand, high frequency trading in the stock world, it's really of two different types. One is that the information, now there is the insider trading rules for the stock markets. Um, there are arguments to be made, and I've read them, that insider trading rules are foolish um, and others that are not. I'm not going to enter into that discussion. But the way it works is this. A large, say, institutional order comes into one of the exchanges. Now, remember, there are upwards of 40 different exchanges, and I don't know how many more so-called black pools. And I'll explain what they're – and there are black pools and currencies, too, and I'll tell you what they are. Um, it's amazing how much information there is to, to cover in something like this. You know, I, I, one of the things that I've always found fascinating about currencies, and, and honestly, when – um, it went about, in, about the year, in about 2000, about uh, 15 years ago, when electronics really started to take over currencies, it was fascinating to watch the markets change. It was fascinating in its effect on people, on careers, on prices, on what had been important information and suddenly was no longer important information. For an exchange, I'm talking particularly about price. And I think I've told this story before. When we started, I only have so many stories. I wish I had more, but I'm not the world's greatest rock on tour. Um, when we started a World um, FX Solutions, the prior firm that we um, sold to City Index in 2007, um, there was a great debate amongst the partners as to whether in our demo we should offer live prices. You know, lots of times you will see on – say you'll see delayed prices on indicative systems such as bloomberg and stuff like that they'll say prices are 20 minutes old all of that i, I feel is very very foolish um and that's the conclusion we came to what had been as a prop tra as a as a currency trader sitting on a, on a bank trading desk the most important information was the fact that you knew where the market was and again this relates exactly to the way high frequency trading for that you knew specifically where the market was because of the voice broker system, um, 10 seconds, 15 seconds before your customers did, and therefore you could use that informational edge to make a great deal of money. And so when we started for an ex when we started FX Solutions, we thought that that would be true in the new electronic world, that information would retain its value. And that was the most important thing to the firm. And that turned out to be completely untrue. As you all know, Anyone can find out where the currency markets are anytime they want to with great accuracy for free. Or as my mother said, free. For free is not the correct usage, and it is not. Um, all you have to do is get on a demo. So the information, which had been the valuable asset for the interbank currency trader in the 80s and 90s, is now a freely distributed non essential, non-valuable piece of information. The distribution system of the internet changed that completely. So the way high frequency traders work, the first way is that when a large order comes into one of the exchanges, say the New York Stock Exchange, but the best price to fill that order, say they want to buy, the best price to fill that order is not on the New York Stock Exchange. It's on one of the other exchanges. So that New York Stock Exchange has to send that order out. As soon as that order goes out to one of the other exchanges to fill it, it becomes public information. Technically, not actually, because most people can't see that. But 
it is essentially public information. So if you get that information on your computer that BlackRock, for instance, wants to buy 5 million shares of GM, although I doubt anybody wants to buy GM these days. Ah, sorry, that was an editorial comment. Ignore that. Then if you can get to the exchange with the better price or any exchange before that order is executed, and we're talking again milliseconds, thousandths of a second, then you know very well, as we all know, what that order is going to do. When that order hits the market, it's going to drive the price up. Maybe not very much, but enough. So if you get there and buy before that order is executed, that order is going to be executed because the order is now into the system. You can't cancel it. So if your computer, one, sees the information, the order's going out, and then jumps in front of it, you can take advantage of that information and buy ahead of it. Now, the purpose of high-frequency trading is not position. It is not prop trading. It's arbitrage. It's exactly what I used to do on the foreign exchange desk at Credit Suisse and Bank of Bermuda when I covered the crosses over dollar, which you can occasionally still get a bid on. It's still getting an advantage on this very, very hard. But you used to be able to in the um, the mark uh, the the the, the mark Swiss trading the German mark against the Swiss franc and the two components, the dollar Swiss trading the dollar against the Swiss franc and the dollar mark trading the dollar against the German mark. Same thing now with euro yen. Um, the place you might the place you could probably still find some arbitrage possibilities in currencies is something like the sterling Swiss or the sterling yen where the spreads are wider. But it's very, very difficult to do it now because of the leveling effect of the electronic market where everyone can see the same price all the time. That's simply no place to do it. So that is arbitrage. What you are doing is you are taking, if you multiply uh, the dollar yen by the euro dollar and you get a particular bid, right? And if you... If the offer in the euro yen is below that, that's an inefficiency in the market, and you can take advantage of it. That's what arbitrage is. That is what high-frequency traders are trying to do. So when they go and take that offer because they think the price is going to go up due to the 5 million shares from BlackRock, and I, these names are purely hypothetical on my part, of course. Um, although the names are real, I have no idea what, this, what they do or they don't do. I just think you tell a better story and you attach a name to it. What they're going to do is they're immediately going to close that trade. They are not in the position of holding a position. Whereas Blacktop, BlackRock probably is, at least that part of the BlackRock trade. Who knows? Maybe some... Maybe the GM earnings are due out, and they think that they're going to be better than expected. Therefore, GM stock is going to go up. That's a position trade. Even they only tend to hold it for 10 minutes. That's very different than what the high-frequency traders are trying to do. So the question is, um, I do apologize, um, but I do not speak Spanish, so I cannot translate that particular phrase. If anyone can and they can put it up there, uh, I'd appreciate it. Um, where was I? So that's what the high frequency traders are trying to do. Ah, okay. Thanks. Let me see if everyone can hear me. Okay, everything says good. Thank you. Um, sorry, I don't know what the problem is. You may have to re um, reload your uh, the webinar, uh, open it and close it and open it again. Sometimes it can get a little bit uh, 
misdirected, shall we say? Okay, so back to high frequency trading. So what the what the high frequency guys do? They do two things. That's one way they work. Okay. Um, now, how do they make this? Because they know uh, I, I do, everyone else can hear on the system here, so I think the problem is probably yours. So my suggestion is that you uh, close down the webinar and then open it up again. So when they take that offer, what they're expecting to do is to sell it immediately. And this is all computerized. There's nobody sitting on a keyboard. So whatever, whatever offer they get, they immediately offer it out. And who is most likely to take that offer? Another high-frequency guy. So the idea that they're stepping in front of – I mean, I know I read one of the – one of the articles I read today, he actually um, opened the article talking about mom and pop investors. That's silliness. Um, that's not who we're talking about here. And remember, the I read another one that was kind of funny. He said that anytime because Goldman, um, in their corporate entity, has come out with saying that high frequency trading needs to be needs to be a regulated and his point on that was that anytime goldman says something they're doing it for their own benefit and their own rent seeking activities in the market trying to this is his opinion the author of this um, article todd sawicki from the washington post i don't know if he's from the washington post but anyways from the washington post um that they're seeking to maximize their rent seeking ability um, that's the economic turn where an entity involved in economic activity attempts to improve their profitability by making the rules of the game to their benefit. So his point was that if Goldman is for it, that is increased regulation, then it's unlikely, then they're probably doing it from their own point of view, which is perfectly legit, and they shouldn't be criticized for that. But that doesn't mean that it's into the advantage of everyone else in the market. Okay, so back to it. So what the high frequency guys are trying to do, they're trying to do that, and then within milliseconds, that means less than a second, they're going to sell that position out. If they buy it ahead of the order, they're going to sell it out. So there's a serious technological arms race here. You need the fastest computers, the best connections, because whoever gets there first is going to who, – who said that? Nathan Bedford Forrest. A Confederate general in the Civil War said, somebody asked him, what's most important in a war? Whoever, or I think he in battle, he said, um, whoever gets their firstest with the mostest would win. Well, that's basically what the high-frequency guys are trying to do. And once they have that offer, who's likely to take it on the other side? Another high-frequency guy. Now, the market is going to go in that direction anyway because of the – large GM buy order, say, from BlackRock. Now, what is something else that's taking place here? That in order, perhaps, to sell that bid that was taken by the high-frequency trader, they have to offer it inside the spread in the market because they want to make – they don't want that position. They want to convert that position. So how do you make sure – if the market is 30-33, how do you make sure that you get paid if you're long? Well, you offer it 32, you offer 31. So that's exactly what they're doing. So one result, which we have all seen, and we've seen it in the currency markets too, um, the efficiencies, as far as pricing go, increase. And this is a benefit to everybody. So you have to be very careful because markets always seem, when characterized from the outside, as something that is tricky. And that's not necessarily true. You have to understand both the purpose of, or you have to consider, shall we say, both the purpose of the markets and how they function. So one thing that the high-frequency traders have brought to 
trading is efficiency of spreads. And we've seen this in foreign exchange as well. We're about to launch a, a variable trading platform on MT4. And the spreads, I remember, you know, 10 years ago, spreads were much, much wider than they are now. People are trading on variable platforms now in foreign exchange are seeing one to two point spreads in normal non-volatile markets for everybody. And it's competition amongst the exchanges. If there were not, and we're not an exchange, but I mean amongst the market makers, if the electronic market makers such as ourselves and many other firms were not out there, who would be offering those type of spreads to retail traders? The answer is no one. Because it wouldn't be in anyone's interest to do so. It is in the interest of the market makers like ourselves and FX Solutions and everybody else to offer tighter spreads. Why? Because we're competing for the customer's business. So the tighter spreads in equities that have been brought about by high frequency trading and electronics and other things too, in the end, benefit everyone. Because the retail trader also gets the benefit, and so does the institutional trader, of tighter spreads. Okay, there are two other aspects to high-frequency trading in equities that I'm going to deal with, and we're going to move on to foreign exchange. After all, this is a foreign exchange platform. Although, actually, as I said, you know, ourselves and many other uh, participants now are offering, you know, sort of the, the, the grail of trading is to offer all instruments internationally traded on one platform. We saw this, I mean, this is, you know, very obvious to everyone. And the biggest problem with it, honestly, is the myriad of regulations and national jurisdictions that are involved. I mean, the most famous stock market in the world, of course, is the New York stock market. Well, the New York stock market is regulated by the American government. And to some degree, although less so, by the New York and had some authority over the New York state government. New York City government really doesn't play anything. For it. Um, although I'm sure our new mayor would love to get involved. Editorializing, I take it back. Um, so it becomes you have to in order to in order to satisfy the abilities. And there is a lot to be said for regulation. Um, and regulation is intimately involved in the equity markets. It is not nearly so involved in the foreign exchange market, certainly on the bank level, it's not involved really at all, except on for the capitalization and other ideas for the banks um, internationally, because they're all based locally, um, nationally. In the retail side, though, there has been some impact with regulation, particularly in the United States and other places where various items um, having to do with the market have been either limited or outlawed. But um, in general, you can still find it. Okay, so the two other aspects of high-frequency trading are this. We dealt with pricing. Yes, that's exactly where I'm going with next. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about liquidity next. You're absolutely right. Um, so first of all, we dealt with high-frequency trading by necessity tightens the spreads. It's not the only thing that has tightened spreads, but it is certainly one thing that has tightened spreads. Competition amongst Exchanges, there used to be three or two in the United States. There's now 40 or 50, and God knows how many dark pools and other. So that competition brought in prices. The same way prices and um, Charles Schwab and the, other, and the other retail houses have brought in competition to almost all aspects of the business. That's one thing. The next is liquidity. All of that, does it matter, let's put it this way, does it matter whether or not a high-frequency trader, high-frequency trading program intends to hold that position for three milliseconds or three years? If you're on the other side of that trade, does it matter? Of course not. Your trade is completed. That's all you care about. That's all you should care about. So all of these additional players in the market 
do provide liquidity. Even if most of the liquidity that they, whom, to whom they provide most of the liquidity is other high frequency traders, perhaps institutional traders, the effect is the same. Who else benefits from all this trading? Well, the exchanges benefit from it because they get paid, you know, their trading fees. So the exchanges love it. Because if you're doing 5 million trades, two sides, the exchange gets paid. So it's great. The last item of uh, high frequency trading, and this one is a bit probably more controversial than most of them. And this is actually the item that Michael Lewis, um, I haven't read his book. Uh, I don't know if I will because I have so many things to read, um, but I recommend anything he writes highly, and so does everyone else. Um, he really is a very entertaining writer. He tells a wonderful story. Um, I've mentioned this before. The, uh, the book he wrote about the financial crash called The Big Short is absolutely fascinating. Um, I know through a number of uh, – through my wife who worked on Wall Street about a number of the people in the book. And the characterizations and the stories, and also through my own experiences on Wall Street through that period, are both accurate and fascinating. They really are. Um, there is, and one of the things I've always found fascinating and still do about markets, is their eminently psychological cast. In aggregate, markets are psychological creatures, and that's why, at least for me, they have retained their interest. And in fact, as you become a participant in the market on a wider scale as uh, we are now as a market maker, um, you get to see that more often rather than when you're a trader sitting on a trading desk or at home trading where you're specifically concerned with what the market's going to do in the next five or 15 minutes. When you step back a bit, the psychological aspect of it becomes much more evident and also much more, to me, at least fascinating. Okay, so the last item I'm just going to touch on briefly because um, it is specific to the foreign exchange, I mean, specific to the equities market as well, apply to foreign exchange. And that is a lot of the retail flow, apparently, and this is something I just read about, um, from some of the aggregators that we, that we call them foreign exchange, um, uh, the retail houses is sold out to wholesalers who then go out and look for it. Well, the wholesalers, one, have that information, and two, they get paid for that. So if you have a order with one of the retail houses, that retail house is not executing that order. They're selling it to somebody else for a small fee, and then that, pers that entity is aggregating the order and they have one information that they can act upon. And in that case, there is some, I suppose, question about whether or not there is someone is going to use that information to execute their own trade and then take a bit of profit out of the market. It's, again... There are economic and the, the reason this is such a fascinating topic is because it is with – there are legitimate points, I feel, on both sides of the discussion about high-frequency trading. Does high, has high-frequency trading and the electronic aspects in the equity markets have tightened spreads? Without, without a doubt. Does it provide extra liquidity? I don't see how you can argue that it doesn't. There's another ask, There's one other thing I've heard about, and this is essentially putting it. You used to call it foreign exchange spoofing the market. Um, when they had when when you had let's put if I had a big order, say to buy with the voice brokers, it's much harder to do with electronic brokers. If I have big order to buy, say, three hundred million dollar mark or 300 million euro at 50 and the market's 50 54 or 50 53 what i can do is to take a bit of a risk i want to get those that order in i want to i want to execute it but i also want people to hit it 
well, I want them to hit on my bid at 50. I don't want to have to go out and pay a 53. So what I can do is I can put an offer in at 52 or even 51, trying to move the market out into my order. Um, it's risky if you want to actually go out and hit somebody else's 50 bid because you don't know what's there, and then you're short. That's, that's pretty risky. I have heard that the, uh, and I've read this also, so I know that it's true, that, that some high frequency, one of the high frequency technique is to put in an order that's never intended to be executed for a large amount and then, then immediately take it before it can be executed in an attempt to do the same thing. Um, how can you check that? Well, I mean, you look at all of some of the electronic tape, and if they if their their system keeps putting in an order an offer you know to sell gold to sell GM I'm not picking on GM here um, at 52 the bid is you know 50 50 50 53 they keep putting it into 51 but they take it out so quickly that it's never executed um, yet that information flashes through the flashes through the uh, the public information system. And it appears, perhaps, and then maybe somebody will hit the 50 bid. Okay. Um, that is something which the regulators will have to deal with. Um, they certainly have authority to deal with that. And you can come to your own conclusions, and I will not um, enter into it, onto whether or not that is a legitimate activity of trading. Um, if you never intend to execute the trade, perhaps it's not. Um, but again, I will leave that one alone. Okay, now let us move to the foreign exchange market. Um, are there any questions? Again, I like to do this you know, as a colloquium, as I've said many times, rather than as a lecture. So if anyone has any questions about high-frequency trading in the equities markets. And, you know, another thing, I was speaking to some of my colleagues here in the firm, and um, they're all familiar with this. Um, some of them are from the equities markets. And they said it's something interesting, that – the, the time for the huge profits of high-frequency traders is long past. It was eight years ago when this first started. Now, what does that mean? That means that the high-frequency traders have taken the arbitrage out of the equities markets. They have made them more efficient. They have tightened up spreads and they have provided liquidity. Why? You know it's true because it's much, much harder for the high frequency guys to make money now than it used to be. It's exactly the same thing that's happening in the currency markets. Okay. Let us now shift to the currency markets, which operate in a different fashion, but of course the principles are the same. The evolution of the, of the currency markets has been from, and I know I've spoken about this in passing many times, has been from a voice broker market to a combined uh, voice broker and direct market where the traders, as myself was, would hear the prices from their brokers, um, and there was some liquidity there, but the bulk of the liquidity was provided by calling other banks on the Reuters system which in the late 80s was nothing more than a proprietary chat system. That's all it was. I would type in MSFT SF5, and I'd send it out, and that would go to Morgan Stanley Foreign Exchange Trading, price in $5 Swiss. That's what they would see on their screen. They would type in 45.50, and I would put in nothing, buy five, B, F, or S, F. And that would be it. That would be the trade. They would then confirm our, our, confirm our deals um, where we get our currency delivered, and that would be the end of it. So that's where the liquidity came from. A little bit of liquidity. Some liquidity was in the broker market, but, and they got paid a fee for it, a brokerage fee. And the Reuters people um, got paid a small fee, depending on whether you were uh, – I believe they got, they got paid a small fee. So that's where it came from. EBS, electronic, brokerings, electronic Brokerage System, came in in the late 90s, 
uh, from between about, I think it started about 96, if I remember. Um, and this was simply a posting. You, um, it's a, you would simply, if you had something to do, you simply put it up there. You did not originally see the whole display the way you do now. Um, and again, you, what you would do is you would then buy five or sell five. You didn't know who was on the other side of it. Initially, you had to put in the entire amount. And then um, EBS put in a, a facility where you um, you might have 100 to go at 50, but you'd only put in five at a time, and the market would continue to see that. Again, but what started to happen is the ability to deliver the information electronically started to provide pricing efficiencies. Because originally, the EBS system was open only to banks. But gradually, EBS made money on brokerage. So the more, they, the more people they had on the system, the more money they made. So there was every incentive for EBS to widen out the pool of people who were participating, which is what they did. And what happens? You end up with more immediate liquidity in the market. What else happened? Because people wanted to get trades completed, the spreads started to compress. What else happened? Because more and more people, this is pre-internet, more and more entities had access to EBS, more and more customers of the traders of myself knew where the market was. So you could no longer quote five and ten points. You had to narrow your spreads. Why? Because your customer who's asking you for the price has got an EBS system and he's looking at it. He knows where the price is. So both liquidity and pricing became more efficient. Next step, the Internet. As I told you earlier about our firm, FX Solutions, in the early days where we were questioning how to do this, the market decided the, the exigencies of business decided for everybody. The necessity to compete, to gain customers, drove the market in one direction. The free and instantaneous distribution of information pricing information. Again, a huge efficiency. You, us, we as retail traders no longer have to deal with 10 points in sterling. Five po we can get prices down to one point almost all the time. Again, inefficiency. Now, execution in the foreign exchange markets. It has changed a great deal, but the principles are pretty similar as far as what happens. Now, again, just like the equity markets where the proliferation of exchanges, although it's a little different in equities. So this is what banks have done. I remember a couple of years ago, I was at a, uh, a trade show and there was a panel on I don't think it was, it was actually a regulatory panel. Um, but anyway, I asked one of the traders, I think he was from Goldman. I don't mean to pick on Goldman, I'm not. Um, change has always been a bank, a bank to bank, B2B in the modern parlance, uh, entity instrument. Um, the banks have, the banks are run, of course, nationally. With and internationally with all sorts of uh, capital requirements. But within those parameters, the banks have exchanged, have traded with each other on a credit basis. You had a certain credit line, and this still works that way. You have a certain credit line, that is what you're allowed to do a number of deals with, you net at the end of the day. That's the way the banks work. It's purely credit. That's exactly the way the bank customers work too. The bank will extend a credit line to a customer that wants to trade foreign exchange, exactly the way 
retail does, except retail is margin, but the principle is exactly the same. And you trade back and forth to the to the limit of your credit line. Okay, so to what the currency markets do. So you now have, because of electronics, you have a great deal more trading. Now, a lot of the, and, the, and if you look at the, B, the BIS figures, Bank for International Settlements, it has gone up and up and up as far as the amount of volume that's going through foreign exchange. And this is one of the reasons. One of the reasons are companies like ours. The others are people who trade with the banks and people who actually trade between the banks with, because, you know, a customer, a, a high frequency trader or any sort of institutional trader may want to trade on the dark, but what he really wants is the execution. He doesn't care where he gets it, which is exactly the same reason that T does provide liquidity to the equity market. As again, if you're on the other side of the trade, you don't care where it's executed. You only care that it's executed at the best price possible. So if there are more people providing, there's more chance of better execution. Now, in equities, you're not supposed, and I, again, I say suppose because I don't have the equities work particularly well as far as this nitty gritty, as granular as we would say, um, execution. You're not supposed to front run an order. So if Again, somebody's buying 5 million shares of Goldman at 50. You're not supposed to go in there and buy at 51, knowing that as soon as that uh, order starts getting executed, or say, you know, they, they want to go out and pay the offer. So they're going to buy it at 52, which is where the offer is. You're not, before you start executing, you're not supposed to go out and buy a couple hundred million shares for yourself so that when it goes up, you'll benefit. You're not supposed to do that. In foreign exchange, that's not the case. On the bank desks where the orders are, that's standard practice. It's something that's always been done. It's the way foreign exchange works because don't forget, foreign exchange is a bank market initially. And the vast bulk of the volume that goes through there and all of those bank desks are trading operations. As a trader, you have a, or as an entity, if it's a prop desk or a prop program or an algorithm, you have a, you know, responsibility. You're supposed to make money. It's part of your job to do this. And the other side of that is, it's also part of your job to execute the orders that are dangerous, such as stop loss orders. Made for many, many, many nervous afternoons on the New York desk, when the liquidity starts to dry up, London goes home, and you're sitting on a $300 million mark order if it goes five points lower. You want to have nerves? That's nerves, because it's hard to execute. And if you make a mistake, whoosh, the P&L just disappears. So that is the way the currency markets work. It's the way the currency markets have always worked. It's part of the essence of the way the currency markets are. So the idea of front running an order as something which is illegal is it doesn't exist in the currency markets. So for a high frequency trader, again, that is not something that they can take into consideration. The other aspect of the currency markets, which is quite different than equities, is that it's still to some degree, a fragmented market. The main aggregator is EBS. That's where the banks still put in their prices. But a great deal of volume takes place in the individual black pools that banks run. So if someone, and, and these are not only high-frequency traders, you know, guys who are running algorithms that want to close the position as quickly as possible. They're essentially trying to do arbitrage. Um, in, these, in, in these systems as well, you get varying length horizon, time horizon prop traders. So if somebody's computer-driven program or someone's decision trading in one of the um, – I'll answer that question in a second. 
It's a little difficult, but I'll try. So say some say NatWest. Are they still in business? I think they are. Um, there used to be so many banks and there's so fewer now. Um, Nat, NatWest has its own dark pool, creating foreign exchange. And it's not a high frequency. And there's somebody on that pool that's not high frequency, okay? And he starts, he goes in or she goes in and buys 500 million or a billion euro from all of the other high frequency and other people participating in that system. Well, what's going to happen? All of those people who got paid are now short. Some of those are going to go out into the market, into, into other banks, into the EBS system. Because they don't want to be they don't want to be short. The thing in foreign exchange for most of the participants is to cover the trade and hopefully make a pip or two or whatever it is, some fraction. They don't want that position. The prop guy, he wants the position, but everybody else doesn't. So that purchase is going to spread out from that particular, and this happens very, very quickly. We're talking seconds or less. But again, that's different than what happens in the currencies because the links are not as tight. And it then goes, we see it on the retail side because we didn't do it. Now, if we were sitting and moving the market, we would see that as well. So the high frequency trading is different because there isn't any combined exchange in which to execute. You can't really step in front because there is no exchange information. The rules in equities are such that the only advantage someone can get is by getting better technology, which simply lets them see information sooner. Nothing like that exists in foreign exchange. You don't see it. We don't see it until the price actually moves. Well, that may be a couple of seconds after or more after that initial trade hit the dark pool at a bank and started to spread out. Because the only linkage between the um, between all of the different participants in the foreign exchange market is the price. We all see the same price, having to do with latency and other firms like that. But we all see the same price. See, that's not true in the equities. In the equities, there are, there's two informations. There is the information as the order, which was not executed on the New York Stock Exchange, goes out to one of the exchanges. That, as soon as it leaves the New York Stock Exchange, that becomes public information. And that exists as discernible public information before the order is executed. Maybe it's only nanoseconds, but it's still a time which human systems, computers, can deal with. Foreign exchange, that isn't the case. If you're not participating in that particular Pool. And in fact, if you're not the person executing the order or the system executing, order, you don't know it until the price is moved. And this is always true. So there isn't any real sense that anyone could have had this information before you. What high frequency trading can do in currencies is attempt to do arbitrage, especially in the crosses. We tried, we did this at FX Solutions, one of our um, Sister companies in the early days developed a system to do this, and it was very successful. We sold it to the Bank Bank of America. The problem is you have to have someone on the other side of the trade. And in order to execute, there's no requirement that a bank has to execute anybody to any amount. So the system doesn't turn out to be scalable. Because if, you, if, if a bank or an entity is willing to, to give you a priority execution on one million, 1 million of any currency basis, they're not going to give it on 50. Why? Because the trade's against them. So the idea that high-frequency trading is an issue in foreign exchange is not one, that I, not one that I ascribe to. Because of the different nature, one, of the execution in foreign exchange, and two, and in the far more distributed uh, execution systems that the idea that that there's information flowing out that you can take advantage of before the price changes is not true in foreign exchange okay now let me try and and um, answer some of these questions 
Uh, yes. No, I really don't. I mean, people are trying to do this. In foreign exchange, they tend to, they, you know, they, people tend to call it scalping or something like that. Um, remember, what you're trying to do is, if you're, if you're, what you're really trying to do is arbitrage. Scalping is essentially arbitrage. You're taking one price that you think, for whatever reason, is out of line, and you're making it, you're taking it. So you're bringing the market to the place where it's supposed to be, whatever that means. Um, that's what algorithm, that's largely what algorithmic trading does. So I don't think there are thousands of, of anyway, the speed at which it's necessary to operate, to take advantage of these types of anomalies in the market are not something that humans can do. There was a time, and I did it many times, where a human sitting there calculating and pounding out a calculator could arbitrage the market. I used to do it all the time. You would deal in dollar mark and dollar Swiss, and you do the other side in the cross, and you could often get a price. You could get an advantage. You could also do it from the IMM, converting the futures into spot and do it that way. Okay, next question. Uh, we're going to have to end soon because I think we're right at the limit here. Um, that's a good question. Uh, bank traders, I don't think, bank traders sitting on spot desks do not, or at least they didn't when I was doing it, I don't think they are now, don't do algorithmic trading. Algorithmic trading is almost ex is exclusively computer driven. And so the places where they can execute primarily are places that let them execute quickly. And so, by and large, their largest counterparties are going to be other programs of the same type. Now, if a bank is sitting there with its, you know, its private dark pool, that's going to be comprised of many things. Because for the bank, if a bank has orders, it benefits the bank to execute them internally if it can rather than externally. There's a cost to executing externally, and there's also a problem with what's going to get filled. If all of a bank's orders, so if somebody, a huge bank, so like Deutsche Bank or Citibank, they have an enormous book of foreign exchange orders. I used to work these orders. This was part of my job. So if all of those orders, and we, what we did is the traders actually had to sit there and execute those orders. Um, in the EBS and with the other banks. That's not the way they do it now. Now, all those orders are put into the bank's internal pricing system, and a lot of those orders are executed against each other. So that's the place where the algorithmic trading operates. And those trading systems, those algorithms, will also operate um, in arbitrage across crosses and all of the other things. These things are now, you know, we're not only dealing with the Majors, when it comes to the banks and arbitrage and algorithmic trading, you're going to be looking at a lot of the smaller currencies that are still priced because the spreads are wider, the information is less evenly distributed, so there is more chance for catching an anomaly in the market that you can turn into profits. Okay, folks, um, if there are no other questions, I think we should probably end here since we have run over. Um, I hope this has been informative. I know there weren't many visuals attached to this, but there weren't too many, and I didn't really talk about the charts here. Um, I know there weren't, uh, there aren't really too many visuals that I thought I could prepare for this. So I hope you will grant me the indulgence of having been largely talking today without illustrating any charts. I will put up my email address. Um, at Worldwide Markets. If anyone has any questions or any topics that they would like to discuss with me um, or questions they'd like answered, please send me an email and I will be glad to answer them. Again, I thank you all very much for attending. It's always a privilege to do these webinars. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Thank you.